we've seen new escalations in the Middle East between Iran and Israel. And Israel has attacked Iranian consulate in Syria. And right after that, we've seen that Iranian government, Iranian army has seized an Israeli ship in the Strait of Hormuz. And right now we've seen that Iranian are attacking Israel. And what's going on? What's your take on this attack? Well, I think, first of all, uh, that we are not in a completely new situation in that sense, because we had already attacks against Iran uh, on Iraqi soil, and namely the attack against uh, Qasem Soleimani in 2020. And we had a very similar situation then. Uh, we noticed uh, that the uh, this attack on Soleimani was possible with the help of the Israeli Mossad, by the way. So the Israeli were already involved in that in that attack. Now, what we had uh, uh, early April uh, this year is an attack on a diplomatic delegation. And this is this is the uh, uh, an escalation step, a definitely uh, escalation step, because it violates the Vienna Convention of 1961 that grants immunity to the diplomatic personnel. And uh, we see that Israel has basically not well. Basically, Israel disregards the international law. Uh, as as soon as its interest is con is uh, concerned, uh, Israel will not consider the international law, and that was blatant in that case. Now it's clear that in that uh, situation, Iran had to, let's say, res make is Israel to respect its sovereignty. Because even an embassy is a national ter is considered as national territory, and it's a matter of sovereignty. Uh, I didn't anticipate that Iran would attack that way, to be honest. Uh, but I, I miscalculated my my assessment at that time, and I miscalculated, or yes, uh, the, the miscalculated the fact that first of all, it's a question of sovereignty. And therefore, uh, Iran was, um, in fact, had to reestablish its rights to the sovereignty. First of all, that's the first thing. The second thing is that I didn't realize that, uh, in fact, I knew because after the attack on Soleimani, Iran wanted to reply, but he wanted to reply in a very let's say, res uh, uh, restrained matter, manner. He didn't want to engage into a large scale war with, with the United States. And therefore it had through the Swiss embassy at the time, it had some discussions with the US in order to make sure that it would react in a very commensurate me measure. And that's what happened. In fact, there were a few attacks against uh, U.S. bases in Iraq, and that was it. And I forgot that aspect. And this aspect or this way of handling things is exactly the way the, the Iran, Iranians have dealt this, this time. They tried to get in touch with the U.S. through the Omani, uh, the Omani government or authorities, and they try to make sure with the US two things. The first thing is that they wanted to make sure that the US understand that Iran will not engage in an all out war against Israel and will have a limited response and restrained response uh, to this uh, the Israeli attack. That's the first thing. The second thing is that Israel, uh, Iran, make sure that the U.S. would not intervene in the conflict. It was a bilateral issue between Iran and uh, and Israel, and the Iranians tried all their best through this negotiation to make sure that U.S. would not intervene. 
And in fact, it's exactly what we, we happened. What happened? Uh, the U.S. didn't misinterpret the uh, the Iranian attack, and in fact, didn't intervene. They said they would help Israel to protect. So that's why the U.S. intervened in the sense that they provided some anti-ballistic missile capabilities uh, to the uh, to Israel. But they didn't intervene in the conflict. They didn't uh, uh, wage any attack against Ira Iran. So we have here uh, a, a, an example of a very sophisticated way uh, to answer the crisis. And I think if we if we look at the crisis as a whole, we can say that Iran has shown an extremely mature and sophisticated way to in the crisis management, if you want. They had to respond. I think everybody understands that it had to respond, but they didn't want to get, go into an escalation. The escalation step was made by Israel, not by Iran, because the, the Iran is a reaction to something that, that uh, uh, was an escalation in itself, even if the scope was probably uh, in terms of... Uh, of the number of explosion or things like that was not big, but it had uh, quite significant co uh, uh, consequences. So we can and we can compare the way the Iranians um, have managed this crisis with the way Israeli managed its own crisis. We see that in Israel, as soon as you have a crisis, it responds very quickly without even knowing exactly what's going on. Uh, and that's exactly, by the way, the reason why you had so many casualties on the 7th of October, instead of calming down, trying to understand and react based on an understanding of the event, of the event, they reacted very quickly, massively and brutally. And as a result, they, in fact, they created more problem than solution. The Iranians are very different, and we see that they are, and that was exactly the same thing with Soleimani. They, they calm down, they think, they plan, and they do. And I think in that one should be a model in the in the in the way such kind of crisis is managed. Um, <clears throat> And so that's that's the, the 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 let's say the overall assessment of of the the way Iran Iran has uh, managed the, the crisis. Now, in terms of um, the military uh, uh, side of it, uh, I expected Iran to involve much more uh, proxy militias like Iranian uh, Iraqi militias or the Hezbollah. Uh, or other militias. But in fact, we see that Iran reacted from its own territory and basically was the main uh, the, the main actor in that in that reaction. The Hezbollah played a role. Uh, it was probably coordinated, but um, it didn't play a major role. It, it was more like a, a side, uh, a, a, a side show, if you want, um, probably to help to saturate uh, Israeli defenses, but it was a side show. The main show was uh, carried by the uh, carried out by the by the Iran from the Iranian territory. That that's important to say, and it's important to say in many respects because it's not just a matter of who was involved. It's also the matter of, as I said before, Iran wanted to raise or to make clear that it was a, a problem of sovereignty, and therefore it had to carry out the main effort of this uh, attack, if you want. And that's the reason why they attacked from the Iranian territory and not from proxies like uh, Iraq. So I think it's important to, to, to note. And the second aspect of this is that by not involving all the proxies with um, like the, the, the Houthis or the, the Hezbollah or so, 
that means uh, Iran has an option to escalate the conflict or to escalate a, a, an additional response if we come to that point. Because um, now we are in a situation that we, we still don't know if Israel wants to retaliate to this attack. And then if Israel retaliates, then Iran could retaliate again, but by increasing the, the level. And then it can engage other weapons and other actors. So uh, it, it's interesting to see that in some respect, you have uh, a, a, a similarity between the way the Iranians react and the Russians do war. They always manage a, a, a door for possible escalation. They never go to the maximum of their capabilities. They keep some capabilities in reserve in order to step up their, their response. And that's, in fact, that, that's very interesting because, again, it's absolutely not what we have seen in, on the Ukrainian side and not what we have seen on the Israeli side as, uh, as well. They engage very quickly uh, at full speed into, into the conflict and they have no reserve. They cannot increase the level if necessary. But I think there is a strategic thinking uh, in that uh, with the Iranians. Now, how this um, this attack unfolded? It's also interesting to see that the uh, the Iranians have perfectly calculated the way this attack should be done. They understood that Israeli has uh, have uh, the Israelis have uh, um, an extensive uh, air and and missile ballistic defense system. And with the Aero 3 and the, um, the Iron Dome and, and other, um, other anti-ballistic or anti-missile missiles. Therefore, they knew, they perfectly knew that. So the, the way the attack was waged is, took that into account. You had the first wave of attack with very light and very inexpensive uh, drones like the Shahid 1, uh, 100, uh, uh, 136 and 138. And <clears throat> these drones are very, very cheap. So you can send hundreds of them and that will prompt a reaction from the air defense. And that's exactly what happened. And we, we, we have seen that the, the first wave of, of attack was probably 99% destroyed. That's, that's absolutely possible. Then the, the Iranians sent a first wave of cruise missile, very inexpensive and old. It was old storage uh, cruise missiles. That went as a second wave. And also a lot of them were also destroyed, although some went through. And then they sent another wave of missile that were a very um they, this was uh, uh, um there were missiles um that uh, multiple uh, multiple entry uh, capability so they they are, they are multiple heads if you want and they can they can uh, address attack the objectives separately and that's exactly what, what happened. Those missiles, we have evidence of that because there are videos that show it, they, that the, these missiles went through the defense. Actually, as the missiles arrived, there were no defense anymore. And probably I can show you a, a video if I can do it. I can show yeah. you and you will see, I can, uh, sorry, I will do like, like this. And here you probably have seen that video, but it shows exactly what happened. So you have those missiles here that, uh, that are anti-ballistic missile. You have here the swarm of the uh, Shahid and other um, uh, um, attack drones and missiles. 
and you have you have explosions because some are hit by the anti anti ballistic missiles, and then you see that's exactly what you see up. Sorry, you you see here. You see these missiles come absolutely unhindered, and you have another one that comes here. There is no defense anymore. Wow. The Israeli have burned out their defense, and that's exactly. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, so that's that's an illustration of how this attack was perfectly coordinated. The the timing of the attack was absolutely perfect, and when the Israelis said that they hit ninety nine percent of the incoming missiles, that's possibly true with the first wave because the first wave was designed to be hit. The first wave was here to saturate Israeli defenses and therefore the, the, they were designed, they were here to be hit. That's the idea. So that the, 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 those, those missiles who hit, uh, which hit the objectives I think all objectives that have been decided by the the Iranians have been hit. So that means that basically, uh, the we we have to be careful with the propaganda here because the 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 Iranian hit the objectives that were meant to be hit, and namely there were two air base, the Ramon Air Force Base, the Nevatim Air Force Base. And then two intelligence facilities, the intelligence, the U the US, the Israeli Air Force Intelligence HQ in Tel Aviv, and the uh, uh, signal intelligence facility on the Golan Heights on Mount Hermon. And these facilities were hit by the missiles. So, and these were the objectives. And these were military objectives. So the, the, the Iranians made sure that it was clear that they didn't want to hit uh, civilian objectives. They didn't want to harm the population. And they wanted to hit specifically military objectives. The two bases, Ramon and Nevatim, are the two Air Force bases that are used by the Israeli to make the strikes against Gaza. So there is no no um, a, a coincidence in that this was perfectly designed, perfectly planned, and perfectly timed to hit that. And <clears throat> therefore, uh, all what we see in the in the media, the Western media, have said that it's a, basically it's a success of the Israeli because they they hit everything that was incoming, but the Iranian had exactly planned this that was the design and and in fact here i showed this uh, short uh, uh, video but in fact there are many videos that shows that the objectives the four objectives military objectives i mentioned before they were all hit as the iranians wanted and they were hit by specific missiles. The other that were hit, the 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 um, the flying objects that we have seen in the sky on the video that were hit by the anti-ballistic missile, in fact, are those who were designed to be hit. Okay, so we see uh, when we 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 sum up the, the the whole thing, we see that the Iranians have not only perfectly prepared their operation at strategic level by having bilateral discussion with the uh, the US through uh, the Oman uh, the the uh, Omani authorities so that was the strategic level and make sure that the US would not intervene or react against Iranian territory so that is a very much a strategic level then we if we go at the operation level we see that the timing of the operation was perfectly chosen. The I, the, the um, missiles and objects that were sent by Iranian are basically old storage equipment. The Shahid one one thirty five uh, thirty six sorry is an old uh, 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 rather old design. In fact, that's the design that was sold uh, to the uh, to the Russians to to for Ukraine. 
Um, the, the Russians modified the design, they produce it independently. They have a, a license production for that and they produce it, but it's very cheap design. That's the reason why the, the Russians, the Russians have also um, sophisticated drones, but they are more expensive. The Shahid uh, uh, 135, uh, 36 and 138, which is the moder a, a more modern version that has a, a, um, a jet engine instead of a propeller engine. But in, in any case, these are very cheap design. So you can you can afford to to send uh, uh, hundreds of them. They are designed to be destroyed. They are suicide drones, basically. So <clears throat> they they did they 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 send that. Then they send uh, older missiles like the Resvan uh, missile, which is also from old uh, 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 old design. And <clears throat> therefore, in fact, the Iranians sent. The, the the first wave the first wave was designed as I said it was designed to be destroyed and therefore they sent very inexpensive stuff that would just just keep the air the Israeli air defense busy and and then of course they reached their objectives as I said so that basically if you if you go back some have said have tried to made make a comparison of the costs of this operation. And if you if you go to the, if you make a comparison, uh, you can see that probably Iran has spent something like 50, uh, uh, 50 million uh, dollars, roughly between, let's say 40 to 60, 70 million dollars. While uh, according to official figures in Israel, they have spent 1.2 billion dollars so the ratio is is absolutely fantastic and and that the, beyond the costs the mere cost of the the problem the issue is that um israel is not able to sustain would not be able to sustain such operation for a long time so if admittedly or if if we admit that Israel would respond to to Iran, and Iran would really launch a full scale attack, as it didn't. So it didn't do that. But if it does it in the future, then Israel would not be able to sustain the effort. And in fact, that's probably the the reason why the Israeli are probably hesitant to to um, uh, to retaliate now because they know that they could not um they could not sustain that that effort and as i said the iranians have sent old equipment not really obsolete but old equipment meaning that iran has an escalation capability that israel hasn't 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 and therefore, I think if we try to make an overall assessment of the whole thing, I would say that this operation at strategic and operation level is a, is a Iranian success and, and a defeat uh, from, the, from the Israeli. And, but of course, we have to be careful with, those, with this assessment. Uh, because in one sense, it's at the end of the day, Israel will try to not to 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 uh, um, to lose its face, and therefore it's good for them if they believe they, they won <laughs> to some extent. So it's 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 probably on the psychological side, it's probably not bad to say okay, both sides were equivalent. Although if we make a mere military assessment and strategic assessment, I think Iranian is definitely has definitely won this this uh, this party. Uh, so um, but again, it's probably healthy to say that, okay, Israeli have have resisted at the end of the day, we can also consider that as some kind of victory. And at least if it allows because, regardless of how uh, retaliation can evolve, uh, 
I, I think it's it's not good to to have this spiral escalating spiral, and I I try to 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 in my books and so on. I try also to have a kind of a moderate language to avoid being too extreme and to to support more very ostensibly one side or the other. Um, because I think at the end of the day, we should find a way to for discussion, dialogue and negotiation. And that's, I think, is, is important. Therefore, even if from a military point of view, as you know, I'm a colonel in general staff. So I mean, I, I've also been trained for air operations and this kind of thing. So I know exactly what it takes in terms of coordination to perform such an operation. I think from my point of view, with my on my based on my experience, it was an a, a Iranian success. But to be politically correct in the sense, not in the sense of correctness, but in the sense of openness for dialogue, I would say, okay, the Iranians have made their point. They made their point very clear. I think it was right to do so. And they have done that, I think, also with a, with a sophistication and a, a restraint, which, in my view, should be commended, uh, because um, it's uh, Iran receives hit from from uh, Israel since decades, and they always try to to re respond in a commensurate way. And I think this should be commended. If if Iran were as Israel, the whole region would be would be totally destroyed since decades. So it's it's good that we have people who are doing a real military and really a good staff work to plan carefully, to know exactly what they are doing, and to hit exactly what they want to hit, and not more, and not engage into brutal retaliation. So that's, on my side, I think is important. And in order to keep that, I would say, even if I don't really believe it at military level, but I think probably on a more political and psychological side, we could say, okay, Israel resisted, and that's fine. Okay, so we are uh, uh, it's it's equal uh, one one on on two on the both sides and now let's let's keep it that way, so that would be my way of assessing this uh, this operation. I think you perfectly describe what has happened during this conflict, and we know that Joe Biden called Netanyahu and he said that they're not supporting Israel to attack Iran to respond to Iran. And we know that in the mainstream media, they're talking about 99% of these drones, missiles have been intercepted and they didn't do anything to Israel. But at the end of the day, behind the scene, we know that something, something different is going on. That's why Joe Biden calls Netanyahu and he says that they're not supporting Israel to attack Iran. Here comes the question, if Israelis totally understand what's at stake for them, if they go along with this type of response and escalations, how do you find this? Well, right now in Israel, you have two parties, I would say, within the even within the government, in fact, or not the government in itself, but I would say the uh, the the. the Israeli apparatus, let's put it that way. You have the intelligence and military people who understand exactly what's going on. And in fact, we know that um, despite all the criticisms, um, the Israeli intelligence understand perfectly the situation. And in fact, we know uh, that since decades, the Israeli intelligence advises the, the various governments to engage into negotiations and engage into a political solution for the Palestinian issue. Um, so you, you have that aspect and you have the political side, which is at this stage right now, uh, totally un unpredictable. 
because you have it's not merely political you have a part of religious uh, aspect in that and it's interesting because some would argue that Iran is also religious but we can see a clear distinction in the Iranian system of the religious side of the government and the, the, the actual management of the country. And you see that the two are very much separated. While in Israel, they are right now, they, they, they are mixed. And therefore, you don't know whether decisions are due to the religious aspect or the political aspect or others. And that makes the, the whole thing extremely dangerous. When you see all the declaration of Netanyahu about Amalek, uh, the, 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 also the, the, the whole issue of the, uh, the destruction of, of all other peoples in, in uh, other people than Israeli in, in Palestine and all that. So you can see that there is something which is, goes beyond rational, beyond the, the, what we understand under rational uh, uh, crisis management. And <clears throat> Now, the problem is that we have right now, and they are, they are we know that there are uh, right now uh, uh, issues within the, 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 the Israeli apparatus that you have different factions within the, the government. And the Netanyahu has several issues with its own intelligence people and also with the military people, even the, 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 uh, the commander of the Israeli armed forces was uh, banned from the Security Council at one point. So meaning that there are, there are tensions within the Israeli government, within the Israeli apparatus, between those religious, political, and predictable people on one side, and the other more predictable, more factual, more rational people that comprise the military and the uh, um, and the the, uh, the intelligence part. It doesn't mean that the military is perfect. Um, the, the way they behave on the on, on the field and all that uh, uh, leaves a, a, a lot to desire, and, uh, and I will not uh, discuss that today. But uh, if we go at the the management, the top management level, we see that there is a much more rational understanding of the problem at uh, uh, intelligence and strategic level than in the field. And this is this is the tension that we are witnessing now. So the problem is, if Netanyahu wants to bypass its own intelligence services and want to bypass the advice of the military, he can do that, and he can do something which is, at the end, which is des desperate. We we can we we could see that. I don't know. I, I don't have the, the, the answer to that because, as I said, it's totally unpredictable. I hope that some rationale will, will come and that the, uh, the, uh, the Israeli will be able to understand the situation and what is at stake. Because I think that if Israel continues to behave as it does, it may well be the end of Israel. And I, I'm not the first one to say that. Some people have said that many times. Uh, we know today that uh, a lot of Arab countries um, hesitate to support the Palestinians or even Iran and all that. You, you may have religious differences that may explain that for one part, but not only. The, the main thing is that those Arab countries are afraid of the United States. But today we see that the United States understands that Israel is, uh, is probably not the best ally at this stage. And uh, we see that also in the West and many Western countries, not all, but many, have understood that probably uh, we should help Israel to have another type of policy towards the Palestinians and probably to push 
for political solution. We haven't, the, the, the Western the West has not done that so far, mainly because of the Americans. But <clears throat> I think now people understand that the situation cannot continue that way. And if if there is if there is a real clash between let's say Hezbollah, Iran, Iraq. Uh, and and others, I don't know which one, but we may have others. Uh, then it may it may gives the courage to some countries, some Arab countries, to join the battle and to end the situation once for all. I I I, I sincerely hope it doesn't go that way because that would mean extreme distraction and probably a long standing war in in the in the whole region and i think it's the interest of nobody but i think people have to understand that if israel behave as it does we may well end in such a situation so i think everything now points at a finding a political solution to that conflict to find a political solution also between Israel and Iran. You know, uh, this uh, this war between Iran and Israel has no sense. Iran has been the best ally of Israel or Israel has been the best ally of Iran for decades. And and suddenly in the early 90s as uh, all Arab states became friends so to say of the west then Iran was the only one because of the uh, uh, Islamic revolution of Khomeini and so on. Because of that, I Iran remained the only possible enemy. And Israel needs an enemy. It figure it, this is also very strange, but it has this it, a security policy that requires an enemy in order to proceed. And that's why Israel decided that Iran was an, an enemy. But there is no no reason for that. I mean, they have no border disputes. They have no uh, uh, religious disputes. Uh, they have there are no fundamental issues between Israel and and Iran. The only one that is uh, frequently mentioned is the nuclear the nuclear uh, bomb but here again we know that iran contemplated in the early 2000s as uh, united states attacked iran uh, iraq iran started to think about having a nuclear weapon because they said basically with right by the way that if you have a nuclear weapon nobody will disturb you and nobody will attack you so it's probably better to have a nuclear weapon and they contemplated that idea but we know that this was they they made some study feasibility studies about this and they concluded that it would create more problem than solution and they abandoned the idea and since then we have, I mean, all the inspections made by the uh, International Atomic uh, uh, Energy um, Agency uh, has demonstrated that I I Iran has no project of having uh, um, nuclear weapons. But it remains in the air and, and Israel still maintains that uh, the, this idea that Iran is trying to have a nuclear weapon. But there is no evidence for that. And that's, by the way, the, re the reason why um, it, uh, the, the joint comprehensive agreement that was signed between uh, European countries, United States and Iran, the G GCPOA, uh, this agreement was basically uh, um, the, the, the Europeans agreed that Iran fulfilled the, the, the treaty and Donald Trump, in fact, withdrew from the, from the treaty, in fact. That was a mistake because it was clear that Iran was complying with this treaty and therefore the, the idea was that uh, if Iran comply, 
with the terms of the treaty, then it would be it would be possible to resume normal uh, uh, economic activities, to remove sanctions and all that. But the U.S. didn't want that. As a result, we still had this idea that uh, Iran doesn't comply, but in fact it did. And Israel is still maintain, maintaining this idea because they need an enemy. And and I, I think this is a little bit insane. Um, Iran is a country that uh, has a huge amount of capabilities. It's a country that is fundamentally... I, 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 I have... Um, I have many contacts with the Iranian community here in in Brussels, and uh, I noted that these guys, and they are, of course they have they are, they go regularly in Iran and all that. Say Iran is a country which is fundamentally very pro West. In fact, it's not a country that wants to to. Uh, it has a history of peaceful coexistence since the the eighteenth century. It has no intention to to overthrow any government in Europe and things like that. So they, we we created we created an enemy from nothing. And I think it would be time to to take probably the opportunity of the crisis we have now, probably to move ahead and try to find a way to to open dialogue with both with the Palestinians and with Iran. One of the things that I wanted to discuss was the air defense system of Israel. We know that one of the more sophisticated air defense system is the Israeli one. And if they can hit some targets in Israel that is equipped with this highly sophisticated air defense, how we can think of American air bases in, the, in that region that can be the target of Iranian army? We know that, as you mentioned, Iran is not interested in attacking American air bases, but in any sort of escalation, that would be the case for Iranians as well. Well, what we know is that apparently uh, the Iranians have not used their hypersonic missiles. Uh, the Fatah 1 and Fatah 2 were not used even even the Haramshar, there's a Haramshar missile missile which is also hypersonic, and that the Iranians didn't use, and probably the Iranians keep that as a reserve just in case things would go wrong with Israel or with whoever, and we know that those hypersonic missile go through any type of descent. They cannot be stopped. And this is, we know that because that's what we have seen in Ukraine. The Russians have tried uh, to engage, have engaged, in fact, not tried, they have engaged um, uh, hypersonic missiles um, to target Patriot missiles or Patriot protected areas. And those missiles go through the Patriot, which is equally sophisticated as the Iron Dome, uh, the Israeli Iron Dome system. Uh, they cannot stop hypersonic weapons. So uh, that's the first response. So the 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 Iranians, as I said, they manage to keep a, 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 a an escalation capability for the case uh, the situation would go worse both with uh, Israel or with the US and <clears throat> so that's why in fact what what is troubling in fact is that they managed to achieve their objectives with old equipment with non hypersonic and old equipment meaning that when you talk about the state of the art air defense system there are still some question to raise because the Iron Dome system is apparently not completely flawless. Uh, in fact, there are may, in the recent years, there have been many, many complaints about the way the Iron Dome works or doesn't. Of course, it intercepts a lot of missiles, and, and that's probably very effective against the rockets that are used 
by the militias in Gaza, uh, like the Islamic Jihad or uh, the Hamas. Uh, they, they have uh, missiles that are homemade, which are probably not very fast, that are purely ballistic, meaning that you can predict the tra trajectory quite well, and therefore you can hit them quite easily. The problem becomes more complex when you have a, a reentry vehicle that goes at hypersonic speed and can be independently di uh, uh, um, directed, meaning that it can change direction very quickly. And that's probably where the, um, the, the Iron Dome and other missiles are probably less effective. But we know that even with the Palestinian rockets, uh, Iron Dome doesn't work very well. And um, they have been, I remember that was 2019, if I remember, uh, that you had uh, um, the, the, uh, the, the Palestinians reacted to uh, some um, uh, strikes in the Gaza Strip and they reacted with a wave of rockets and the Iron Dome was very ineffective in that. Fortunately, the Palestinians didn't target populated areas uh, because, again, for the Palestinian, the problem is not how many people you kill. The problem is that you have reacted. This is a, a very important feature of the way uh, the, 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 the military thinking, if you want, in the um, East, the Middle East at large, but especially with the Palestinian. The, the, the issue is whether you react or not. That's the, that's the issue. It's not how many people you kill. While for the I Israeli, this is how many people you kill, which is important. So there is a total difference of approach in the way uh, you, you, you react to, uh, uh, to, to a, a crisis. But in, in any case, so the, is, the Palestinians shot a lot of missiles or rockets, and th there were a very low amount of those rockets that were hit by the uh, Iron Dome. So the, the Iron Dome has a multiple targeting capability. That means it can identify, uh, identify and handle multiple targets at the same time. But I'm not sure exactly if this works perfectly, especially when you have several um, several rockets that move uh, very close to each other. So uh, I, I think the, the, um, there are a lot of, of issues with this, uh, this Iron Dome. It's probably good for what it is designed for. I mean, namely the uh, Palestinian rockets, but I'm not sure it's so good if we uh, expect um, more sophisticated missiles. Uh, Nota bene, we haven't mentioned that in the in the media, but in the recent months, there have been several attacks from Iraqi militias uh, towards Israel through cruise missiles. And they have hit Haifa and namely, uh, some uh, oil storage facilities in Haifa several times, and this was not uh, um, prevented by the Iron Dome. So meaning that, yes, they have a system that can probably respond or provide an effective response for a couple of situations, but probably not as good as we could expect and probably not for the kind of attack that Iran uh, designed. If it, it's probably good when you have one aircraft or two or maybe 10 aircrafts that attack, so probably then Iron Dome is effective. But when you have hundreds of aerial vehicles that attack at the same time, I'm not sure that the system is very effective. I mean, I don't know, but... Uh, the the result, what we have seen uh, on the thirteenth of April, tends to show that the problem, the 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 uh, Israeli air defense is not as effective as it should to prevent this kind of threat. The other thing would be the participation of Jordan in favor of Israel in this attack, and we know that. Jordan is so close to the Western countries, but right now when something comes to 
this interaction between Iran and Israel and Jordan comes in in the defense of Israel while we have we were having a conflict in Palestine and they didn't do anything about that and how do you see this this, this complexity within the Arab nations well <laughs> To be to be totally frank with you, I may have some explanations on that as the pressure of the U.S. because we have to see that these countries. You can talk about Egypt as well. By the way, e Egypt is a very similar situation. Um, they are so dependent on the U.S. for many uh, uh, for so many things that their the freedom of decision is extremely low. So that must be said. Uh, we have to say these countries have um, a very hard time to, to be sovereign, if you want, because of, of this. There are probably other issues that I'm not really able to, uh, to assess because I, I I, even if I've been in Jordan, I've talked to Jordan. I mean, when I talk to mili Jordan military people, I notice that none of them, none of them were in support of Israel. And when I, I, want, I went there, I went there uh, with the hat of NATO because uh, you know that Jordan has uh, several other countries from the Mediterranean uh, area, North Africa and Middle East, are part of the so-called so Mediterranean Dialogue, which is a kind of partnership between NATO and these countries. And um, I was in Jordan for discussing some project that we had with NATO, but in the discussions I had with the uh, with my uh, Jordanian counterparts, and even they knew I was from NATO and NATO is pro-Israel basically, but when we talked a little bit, when you were a little bit talking uh, on the, uh, let's say, outside of the official uh, uh, the official meetings, then they would say something totally different. And my personal opinion is that if anything would happen in the region, that would make people to decide whether they should be pro-Israel or pro-Arab, they would probably be pro-Palestinian. Uh, that's, that's my personal view based on the discussions I had with the uh, with those those uh, uh, those officers. Uh, of course, it's it's always difficult for an officer because. You know, with the military, you have uh, the issue of loyalty and all that. And I perfectly understand that for military, it's hard to have, uh, a, let's say, an, it, it may have an opinion, of course, but it's it's difficult for military to express that opinion because he's bound by his uniform and the loyalty which is attached to this uniform. So I understand perfectly that. But... It, Within the uniform, you have a heart, and the heart is not in favor of Israel. And uh, that's why I think if anything would happen, and if any we, people were asked to make a choice, this choice would not be in favor of Israel. So that's that's my personal. By the way, it doesn't. It it's not exclusive to the Arabs. I I know a lot of. Western militaries, let's put it that way, even in the US, who, despite the official position of the US, which is, as you know, very uh, favorable to Israel, a lot of military are not. They, they, they still keep in mind that Israel destroyed the USS, the USS Liberty. You may remember this. Um, uh, intelligence ship that was in the Mediterranean uh, during the um, 1967 war, and it was uh, attacked by Israeli Air Force, although the Israeli Air Force knew that it was an American ship, but it was attacked, and um, 
the, the, there are several casualties uh, of the U.S. Navy on that. And the Americans have never forgotten that. It, it's not the problem of the ship. It's the problem of an ally that shoots at you. That's that's something that for a military, it's very... If you are an enemy, you are an enemy. No problem. But if you are a friend and you, you shoot deliberately at you, then you are a traitor. Basically, and and that's that aspect is still very present. Even it's even if it's more than fifty years old, it's extremely present in the mind of the military. And you see that repeatedly if you read the military literature and all that. The USS Liberty is always uh, mentioned by someone. Because that's something that is kept in the mind of, and and you had other other. Uh, you also have the Jonathan Pollard uh, uh, affair, which was a, a, a U.S. A serviceman. Uh, he was member of the U.S. Navy intelligence, if I'm not wrong, and he used to spy for Israel, and he he was granted Israeli citizenship as he was in prison. By the way. And um, Israel asked for his release for years, and finally Donald Trump accepted that. But all the previous presidents, he was jailed in in the early 80s, and he, he remained 30 years. All the different presidents refused to grant him, uh, to release him. Uh, Donald Trump accepted. But this affair is also something that a lot of... Um, American uh, military remember because this guy was was uh, um, providing Israel with uh, U.S. military secrets. So and he was probably one of the most effective Israeli spy, in fact, uh, within the U.S. military system. So all these kind of things. This is it's never good to to attack your friend in the back. It's never good. And that's exactly what what we 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 can see, and uh, therefore I I I sincerely hope that we can find diplomatic solution to the crisis because if it comes to confrontation, probably we may see different behaviors at the end of the day. Uh, and, and by the way, in addition to that, if you if you take everything into account. The current um, uh, the current Israeli government is extreme right wing, which is not very popular even in Europe. So in Europe, you have a lot of countries that have some reluctance to be against Israel because of the Holocaust and all that. But at the same time, in Europe, the fact that Netanyahu is so right wing, an extreme right wing, is not very popular. So. As a result, and that explains why Israel has lost a lot of has lost a, a lot of support in the recent in the last six months, and and even if 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 you read if you look at the polls that were made even in the U.S. even the Jews even the Jews are no longer supporting Israel. They they consider that Israel is. Uh, is not behaving as it should as a member of the international community bound by the international law bound by the international humanitarian law and um, and this is uh, this is uh, this is why i think that the uh, the south african initiative uh, with this um, um with the, with the international criminal court of justice uh, the International Court of Justice, sorry. Um, this could have a huge impact, and I'm not sure the Israeli have measured so far the possible impact of this. And already impact, because even if this court has ruled that there is a plausibility of genocide, in the, in the, in the common language uh, in Europe, people talk about genocide. They remove the word plausibility. Uh, which is, as of now, it's still the plausibility of a genocide, but a lot of people just remove that, say it's a genocide. It's a genocidal state. 
And uh, I tried to avoid this kind of extreme formulation because first of all, it, it, it must be ruled by the International Court of Justice. It must be established. It must be this, uh, decided uh, uh, what, what, how we can define the behavior of, of, uh, of Israel. So it's not up to, to me to make this decision. But uh, nevertheless, people tend to, in fact, go beyond what the International Court of Justice says. And that's extremely negative for Israel. And um, I don't know. I, I think what we have, what we see today, may have impact for the decades to come. We we'll see. I want to wrap up this session by this question: that we know that Israeli government was asking for uh, UN Security Council to have a meeting and discuss this Iranian attack, Iranian attack on Israel. And we know that within this council, we have Russia and China who are totally against this policy of Israel, attacking a, an Iranian consulate in Syria and what they're doing right now in Gaza. And when it comes to this request on the part of the Israeli government, what they're seeking for in your opinion? Well, <clears throat> First of all, before that coming to that point, we have to remember that Iran asked the UN Security Council to make a declaration about the attack on the embassy. And the UN Security Council refused to make that, um, uh, that declaration. By the way, this was a very interesting step because some have pointed out that if the UN Security Council had acknowledged that the, um, the Israeli attack was illegal and could be condemned, probably the Iranians would not have done their retaliation, in fact. Uh, so I, I, I don't know exactly what where is the truth in that, but apparently this was this was a calculation by the um, the Iranians showing that they are always thinking in terms of different step of uh, uh, of of responding to a crisis which is one thing now coming back to this um, this attack i think today we nobody wants to have this um uh, to open door for uh, retaliation from Israel. I think the Americans have made very clear that they don't want Israel to respond to this attack, that in fact Israel, by hitting the Iranian embassy, created the problem, basically. So in fact, they just received what they looked for so far and as a result the the idea that the americans want to i think what i can see as, as of today my opinion is that the americans say okay now you are even and we keep that way and we don't talk it anymore this is past we move forward that's that's probably the both the Chinese and the Russians will certainly not support uh, a, a, a proposal of the Israeli because of the situation in Palestine that has been uh, in fact promoted by the Western countries. And we know that the Western countries, especially the US and the UK, uh, were reluctant. I mean, they, they, were, they were not even reluctant. They they uh, uh, prohibited, they, they prevented uh, the Security Council to adopt some resolutions that would stop the conflict and impose a ceasefire and all that. So in that uh, uh, kind of game, the Russians and the Chinese will certainly not support uh, Israel in trying to invoke 
a, a, a right to respond to this uh, to this attack. So I I have no crystal ball. I don't know exactly uh, uh, what will be decided and how this will uh, uh, develop. But my personal view is that nobody wants to reopen the case. The case has been solved with this operation, which was wisely done, which made no, uh, there, were, there were one or two casualties, um, they, they, but, but it was, it was almost um, nothing. I think there's a, a wounded, a two, uh, a severely wounded, I, if I'm not wrong. I may be wrong on that, but basically we see that the Iranians made every effort to avoid attacking the, the population. So therefore, I think everybody would be happy if this this episode would stop here. And um, that's a, a, from both East and West. That's my personal view. The Europeans may have different views because they are a little bit more extremist, but the Americans, again, everything that we have to remember about the Americans that they are in the presidential election year. So <laughs> that helps a little bit to make the leadership a little bit more reasonable. But basically that's what, what we, we are uh, witnessing. That's my personal view. I may be wrong, but I think nobody wants to reopen that case. The attack has uh, has been uh, uh, conducted uh, uh, very wisely and without, let's say, uh, uh, disproportionate um, damages. So let's keep it that way, and I think that's that's the way it should go. Mm -hmm.